state politics and local issues. We're looking at both today, where Ron DeSantis figures prominently. He weighs in on the mayor's race and the legislature keeps sending bills to the governor to sign. We'll talk with local Senator Jennifer Bradley. We're also talking with City Council President Terrence Freeman. The Republican in Jacksonville explains whether government office was used as, quote, an election ploy. Plus, another view on the topics from Pastor John Allen Newman on This Week in Jacksonville. And thank you for joining us as we now begin the second week of April here in 2023. We're joined today by Jacksonville City Council President Terrence Freeman. And we're going to speak with a state lawmaker in just a moment. But I kind of want to talk, if you would, about some legislation at the state level that would affect Jacksonville. We uh, we talked even last week with a state senator. But House and Senate bills in the Florida legislature will put JEA under the state's uh, Public Service Commission and then could affect the, the yearly contribution. What JEA gives to the general fund. I mean, it's like 120 plus million dollars. Uh, where would you stand on that? Would you, as city council president, would you say, hey, we don't need that state lawmakers? Well, you know, Tallahassee is definitely an interesting place these days with a lot of things happening. Um, but this particular piece of legislation, um, it hits home. Um, you look at what we just traveled through as a city and a community with JEA. I can tell you our council unanimously approved a resolution stating that we do not support this legislation. Um, JEA belongs to the people of Jacksonville, and we're going to do our best to try to make sure it stays that way. There's, uh, there's always talk, right? I mean, in politics, there's always somebody says, well, it might be this. But some of the critics are saying this would be a backdoor way to put Jacksonville into positions where, hey, it makes sense to privatize or to sell JEA. That would be the best option for city finances. Do you ever see that happen? Well, look, the critics are going to have their opinion one way or the other. Uh, I've been in com conversation with our Duval delegation and and I have the utmost confidence that they are going to do their best to sure, ensure that the voices of the people here in Jacksonville are heard um, we have strong leadership in in our in our Duval delegation and in speaking with them I'm confident that the bill sponsor will know that Jacksonville JEA is not for sale and that the leaders of this community are we're going to scream we're going to scream it loud we're going to fight as hard as we need to fight to ensure it and there's even an amendment coming before us now um, passed by or brought forward by Councilman Howland that's saying we want to be carved out. We're going to take it even a step further than saying that we just oppose it. And I hope that we have unanimous support in that. It's just truly expressing that JEA is not for sale. It belongs to the people of Jacksonville, and that's the way it's going to remain if we have a say in it. This became a huge issue just a few years ago. I want to show you, you know, three years ago, City Council President at the time, Scott Wilson, convened a special investiga uh, investigatory committee on JEA matters. So he was honored this week for his courage in that matter with an award from the Jacksonville University's Public Policy Institute. Uh, the committee was part of an investigation into the plan to sell JEA, confirmed it exposed that plot to see the outrageous bonus pay to certain people if they participated, uh, if the utility was, was sold. So, President Freeman, the reason I ask this, you convened this special committee just a couple months ago to look at the JEA issue, but specifically at Council Member Leanna Cumber. This week, we see the committee is now disbanded. It went to the Ethics uh, Committee or Commission, and one of the things they said I wanted to ask about, they said the Ethics Commission said the complaint by the City Council wasn't filed correctly, was outside the statute of limitations, uh, and some commission members said it was just brought up as an election ploy and that the commission shouldn't be used in that way. What do you say to those folks who are concerned about even bringing that to a special committee because that was a candidate for mayor who wasn't necessarily the preferred candidate of City Hall? All right. Well, we know that JEA process was just a process that really challenged the transparency of our government. And my goal as president this year was to make sure that we reinstill that trust that the people have placed in us. Uh, when these facts were brought to my attention, uh, I felt as if I was left with no other option than to let the facts take us where they go. I think what the uh, commission's um, verdict revealed was that, hey, there is some issue here and that maybe they weren't the best place for it. And so now I'm going to really look to the chair of that committee, uh, Councilman Howland, and, and see exactly what the next steps are, what they feel the next steps are, and continue to make sure that we have all the facts answered and all the questions answered to ensure that we have given the community the trust and reinstored the integrity to the process. Many in the community thought that it was, as the commission talked about, a political ploy, weaponizing a part of government there. I completely disagree with that. Uh, for me, in my position, I take the facts as they are. Where they lead us is where we go. Um, and anytime there was an appearance of some type of an issue that, that clouds that judgment, that clouds that picture, we're left with no choice other than to bring it out into a transparent process and allow those facts to take us where they go. And I believe that the Special Investigatory Committee is doing that. 
Um, I appreciate the effort of them referring that over to the Ethics Commission. Was hoping that the Ethics Commission would take some type of an action and bring this to a closure. And unfortunately, they haven't, and it leaves us where we're at now. There's still some unanswered questions, and I'll look to see where our committee chooses to go from there. Part of the reason I bring that up is the perception of City Hall maybe putting its thumb on a, a race here. Let me ask about this. City Hall, are they inserting themselves into the mayor's race in another way? Just this week, we're hearing that the Donna Foundation wants to do a race. They always do the race at Mother's Day. City Hall is potentially going to say, we're not going to give a, a permission to do that because it's so close to the mayor's race. Is this City Hall? getting involved in or, or putting its thumb on uh, a race for mayor? That's a question that I've been asked a couple of times today. And the irony of it is, is, you know, as I have had the pleasure of bringing kids to City Hall and, and sharing them with them, the civics uh, and, and introducing them to the process. And I often share about the, le the legislative branch and the executive branch. Your question completely leads to the executive branch side. The decisions that have been made, the questions that have been answered have been answered by the administration. And so I've referred every question to them because I don't know their whys, I don't know their reasoning. Um, but as a council, there's nothing before us involving that right now. Um, if it does get before it, come before us, then that will be an issue that we will have to address as the council. One of the things that came before council and was nearly unanimous was this uh, University of Florida satellite campus. So $20 million already approved, $30 million maybe in the future. You said, hey, you look at that as a real opportunity for the city, even though some people are like, eh, we don't have enough information yet. No, it's a generational opportunity for our city. Uh, when we look at graduate level programs coming to our city in biomeds and fintech, um, I just start thinking of jobs. One, we look at the construction of the building. Two, we look at uh, as this school is going and now the jobs that it's offering from teaching, from folks that are cleaning the halls, all the way across the gamut. But more importantly, what that research pr provides or reveals to our community, it's gonna, it's gonna interest companies to come to Jacksonville and set up headquarters. So we're looking at even more jobs being produced from it. Uh, and UF Health, and I look at UF, the University of Florida, and then UF Health, which is another one of my initiatives when we think about access to health care, we're $10 million. The governor, and we're grateful for it, awarded us $80 million towards redoing our trauma center. We were able to, under my leadership, to secure $10 million more. And that is specifically now going to be a, a, one of our seven trauma centers in our state, but a place that when you're facing a medical crisis, yeah. you want to go there. When we look at our underinsured and our uninsured in our communities, these are places that provide them with equal access to health care. So I'm very proud of the partnership that our city has with the University of Florida. Glad to have led this process, and I look forward to the generations moving forward of success and benefits for them. Yeah, University of Florida may be in Gainesville, but there's certainly a connection here. There are a lot of fans here, yes, sir. City Council President Terrence Freeman, thanks for the time. Thank today. you so much for your time. Well, stay with us, and we're going to be joined by State Senator Jennifer Bradley. Uh, so much seems to be happening in Tallahassee with new bills passed every week. The legislature's latest moves next on This Week in Jacksonville. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville with Kent Justice. And into our studio today, State Senator Jennifer Bradley. Uh, the timing worked for an in-person visit here because of uh, holiday weekend, but uh, there is still about a month left in this 60-day legislative session. And one of the things I wanted to talk about, it seems like there are so many bills that have been passed already. It just seems like things are, are going very quickly. Do you agree with that? Yes, and first, thank you, Kent, for, for having me today. It's, it's great to be able to visit. It is hard to believe we are at the midpoint of session. Uh, things have been incredibly fast-paced. The, the governor has a very bold agenda. We've seen a lot of his priority uh, initiatives moving quickly through the process, and uh, we've already sent him several bills. Yeah, uh, we've seen him sign several That's bills. Right. Yes, indeed. Uh, will things slow down here in this final month because the... The mandate is you've got to have a, a working budget for the state at the end of this legislative session. That's right, and I think the budget will uh, will will start to uh, take a take a, a bigger presence on the stage. Um, but I don't expect the legislative initiatives to slow. Uh, there's a lot of big bills that have been moving through the committee process that haven't made their way to the floor yet. But I expect it to be a very busy session uh, until we sign a die. So one of the things that uh, it seems like, yeah, many bills are going through, some controversial, just depending on, on which side of an argument you want to be on. Republicans have this supermajority's House and Senate. Uh, some feel like, hey, uh, the Republicans are in power and they're just trying to crush through as much conservative legislation as they can. 
is is that the case? How would you answer some of the folks who are saying, I, I don't know if I like just one party having all the power here, both the executive branch and in the legislature? Yeah, and, and I think that what you saw is the governor had a very decisive win uh, in November, won by, by 19 points. Uh, the, the voter sent a supermajority to both the House and the Senate. Um, and I do think you see that reflected in the priorities that are, that are being pushed through. But if, if you look across the board, uh, there are a lot of initiatives um, successfully being run by both Democrats and Republicans on a host of issues. But it is a conservative agenda. Um, and, I, and I believe that's what the state, the message that the state of Florida sent to our governor, um, and that's what they wanted to see. So let's talk about some of these bills and just give me your, your thoughts here. Six-week abortion ban, uh, school vouchers to private schools, constitutional carry. Those are some of the things that have come out there. Why are those important measures uh, to see turned into laws here in the state of Florida? Yeah, and I, I think it's not the first time we've seen those issues. Those, have issue, those are issues that have been brought, have been debated, have been contemplated by previous legislatures. Uh, and we're in a position now to be able to, to move those across the finish line. Uh, you know, with our school vouchers for a long time, uh, it's been okay in our state uh, to have poor kids in poor neighborhoods be in poor schools. Uh, and we've seen that uh, a move to give that choice, um, and that's been moving forward. And this year, I think we really uh, put our stamp on, on the policy and said every child in the state of Florida deserves to have their parent be in the driver's seat and make sure that they're able to go to the school of their choice because their parents know best. Um, no more should we be funding a system. We need to be funding our kids. Uh, and that policy went through, um, carried, carried really um, in, a, in a veteran fashion by a new Senator, Corey Simon, out of Tallahassee, uh, with a strong personal story uh, about the need for school choice. Um, and so that was exciting to see over the finish line. What about that abortion issue? Uh, in recent uh, years, I mean, we've gone to a 15-week abortion ban. Now the new move, okay, six weeks. Sure. Uh, a lot of folks say that really has taken too much, um, uh, too many of the rights away from women to make a choice. Yeah, and it's, you know, the Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs is what brought that before us. Um, and I think they, they accurately describe that as a very profound moral question. Um, and that sent that decision back to the states. And I would suggest that probably a lot of legislature, le legislators didn't expect to be dealing uh, with that during session. I, I don't think that there was a sense that the Supreme Court was going to give it back to the states to be, able to, uh, to be able to craft our policy of how Florida should have a culture of life. Um, and that's what happened, and, and that was an issue that I campaigned on. I'm, I'm pro-life. Uh, I think you'll see in the bill that there's exceptions for rape, incest, human trafficking, uh, we recognize that not everyone, every woman who's been the victim of rape files a police report. This bill doesn't require that. Um, it does so require, require proof, though, is It does think, require right? a documentation. That could be in the form of a medical report, of a therapist report. It requires documentation, but it doesn't require uh, uh, the victim of rape to go and, and file a police report. And, and that was having those excep exceptions and having those be accessible uh, to women who find themselves, um, unfortunately, in those situations was very important. Uh, but. The fact is we need to do better as a state supporting pregnant mothers, supporting young families, and making sure that these women who, who will now uh, be carrying these babies to term and, and um, that they have the services that they need going forward. And I think that you will see the legislature, as we've already done, continue to expand those services uh, for women across the state. You pointed out to me one of the, uh, one of the bills that, that you're sponsoring here is about uh, steeper punishment for attacking defense lawyers or public defenders. This was something I didn't realize there was uh, any kind of discrepancy on the penalties for yep. something like that happened. So briefly explain that. Yeah, so current law, judges, bailiffs, prosecutors, there's enhanced penalties if you attack them or, or, or you victimize them in the courtroom. Uh, did not realize until after a case in Gainesville where a defendant attacked his defense attorney uh, that the same enhanced penalties don't exist for defense attorneys. Uh, and, and in fact, in, in the case in Gainesville, the, the defendant attacked his attorney uh, and then boasted, you could hear it on the jailhouse call the next day and said, it's just a simple battery. Uh, and it would have been if he hadn't have cracked the, his yeah. uh, defense attorney's uh, skull. Obviously, it was a very serious situation. He ended up being charged with more. Uh, but it revealed a loophole in, a, in, in, in the system, and we fixed that. That sounds like something that would be a bipartisan thing. Yes, Let's absolutely. Let's fix this, yeah. right? 
Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Senator Bradley, appreciate the time and uh, good luck these next 30 plus days to get yes. through uh, the rest of the legislative session. Yes, thank you. All right. So there are multiple ways to look at policy issues like we're talking about with Senator Bradley. We're going to give you another view when we come back. Political contributor John Allen Newman next on This Week in Jacksonville. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville on Channel 4. And in this segment, Pastor John Allen Newman joins us, longtime political contributor for us here at News 4 Jax. And we, we want to offer you um, just an opportunity for a different view here. So the previous two guests, both Republicans, uh, I want to hear from your point of view how things might be viewed differently. There, the changes both in city government and state government in these last couple of years because of redistricting and all of that has put uh, Republicans in a place of power. That's what we're seeing at the state level. And we certainly have had uh, opportunities to see there are differing opinions there. So why don't we start on the citywide level, if you sure. don't mind. Um, this is a really rough, seemingly, race for mayor in the city of Jacksonville. Yeah. A lot of people have said divisive, even including the attack ads that come from one party towards uh, another. Yes. What, what's the view outside of that cocoon of uh, politicians, I guess? I think the pulse on the community broadly is that the attack ads are very harmful, divisive. And in a time where we do see a lot of division, not only in the city, but in the country as well, the city's microcosmic of the nation, that we need persons to help bring us together, not divide us. And certainly when I talk to people in the community, even many Republicans are saying to me that they are really embarrassed by the kind of ads that are being run. Because when you look at what's being said, and you may actually go deeper into that uh, at some point, that the very thing they're using against the Democratic opponent, Donna Deegan, is the thing they all participated in. They right, participated. So specific, there's an ad that came out about a week ago, and it shows a lot of Donna Deegan saying she marched in every one of the Black Lives Matters rallies a couple of years ago, almost three years ago, when mm -hmm. George Floyd was killed. And to your point, uh, the sheriff marched in some of that, the mayor was in some of that. How's a voter or a viewer supposed to figure out what that really is about? It, it really kind of goes to, it's just trying to generate some emotion, right? Yeah, it's a trick to get the amygdala to get activated when people just begin to emote. You know, Freud called it the id, the thing that triggers you. And so they're getting the electorate, those who they want to show up, to be angry and fearful using Black Lives Matter as a kind of trope, realizing that the very people who they are um, trying to say are on their side of the, of the spectrum were actually in attendance. And so at that particular uh, rally protest, after the protest was over, Jaguars were there, players were there. You know, as you already mentioned, this, the sheriff, the former sheriff were there, uh, and the, the mayor was there. After it was over, pretty much so, there were a couple of hundred people who lagged behind, many of them not from Jacksonville, who traveled from city to city just to be divisive and confrontational. Instigators. Instigators, people. yeah, did that here. And to single her out and not mention the others is hypocritical and is disingenuous and it disserves the city. People have a right to be on different sides of the spectrum politically, but they ought to have the truth. And the truth is, if you're going to go after her for that, you've got to mention the others as well. And to not do it is very conspicuous. Uh, uh, Hey, anybody can, you just mentioned it, you got a right to be any political party or feel how you want to be on it. So not every um, uh, African American in Jacksonville is a Democrat, right. but how are, how is the black community responding to this particular attack at? From what I can understand and feel and sense, they're offended and offended at a deep level. I mean, I'm hearing people who are saying, you know, I, I really wasn't excited about this race, you know, because Ilga, here we go again, right? But this was an affront because when you use these kinds of messages, particularly with young black males, it raises a sense of vulnerability. And I had to have a conversation with a gentleman who ran for office recently about that very self same thing because he used very similar ads about Black Lives Matter and saw these images of young black men as if that is indicative of all of Jacksonville youth, and it's not. And you know, speaking about this divide, look, <laughs> it's no secret. I have friends who are in the Trump administration and some who still or were rather and still with him. 
and one of, one of my, what I consider dear friends is running his campaign. Guess what? She's going to be my friend. It, it doesn't sure. matter. I cared about her before. I care about her now. I'm going to care about her after. And because we're friends. And you can disagree on We can on the disagree politics, politically, so, yeah. but you don't throw away people because of political differences. But in this climate, you can't just have a person with a different opinion. Now they have to be your enemy. And that's dangerous. You know, own the libs or own the conservatives. That's unhealthy for our common thread of decency in our community. And we've got to change that. And the kind of things that are happening in this mayor's race is deleterious to our community and it needs to be stopped. And maybe what will happen is election day they may see, hey, we don't like this anymore. I'm thinking through a lot of this. So we were going to talk about some other issues, what's going on on the state side. I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm going to invite you to watch uh, our uh, this week in Jacksonville plus channel on our streaming show here uh, because we want to offer you more from John Allen Newman. You're going to find his explanation of diversity, equity, and inclusion when you join us on News for Jax Plus. It's available on Roku, Apple TV, Fire Stick, Android TV, Chromecast. You just search News for Jax on the streaming device and download it. Once you're there, you're going to find the interview under This Week in Jacksonville. Uh, John Newman, I we have more to talk about, so you stay by. Uh, but for our show, we're going to wrap it up here. And this week in Jacksonville airs each Sunday morning at this time. I'm Kent Justice. Thank you for watching on air on Channel 4, the CW17, and online at newsforjax.com. We're streaming on News 4 Jax+. And be sure to subscribe to my weekly Twidge newsletter, the real bonus for News for Jax insiders. You head to newsforjax.com slash newsletters, and then click to sign up under This Week in Jacksonville. See why every day more people are choosing News 4 Jax, Northeast Florida, and South Georgia's number one source for local news.